Now let's move on to quantitative variables, which are going to take up way more time in this video. First, we have two different types of quantitative variables, discrete and continuous. A discrete quantitative variable takes on values that are countable in finite. For example, the number of goals that you could score in a soccer game, well, that's going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It may say, well, I guess it can be infinite. You could have a million goals in a game. But again, realistically, no, you can't. So typically with a discrete quantitative variable, we're thinking whole numbers only. And if we think about it, you could make a list of all possible outcomes. It wouldn't necessarily go on forever. Whereas a continuous quantitative variable takes on values that are not countable and basically theoretically could be infinite. For example, the weight of a frog. If you think about the weight of a frog, it really could go infinite in either directions, especially when you have a really good measuring tool. Because if you have a good measuring tool that maybe goes to, say, five decimal places, well, even if you're talking about between 10 pounds and 11 pounds, which actually would be a pretty big frog, let's shrink that down a little bit, let's say between five and six pounds. Realistically, right, you have to understand, I hope you all know this, between five and six pounds, there's an infinite number of values, right? Now, even if you say, well, we're only going to go to two decimal places, so there's not an infinite number of values. Okay, but well, there's still a lot, and you wouldn't want to sit and count them all. But again, hypothetically, from five to six pounds, there is an infinite number of possibilities, especially if you add some really precise measuring tool. So discrete, we're thinking countable set number of outcomes that are typically whole numbers, whereas continuous, we got way too many of them to even count because we got decimals upon decimals upon decimals that make for a truly continuous variable that can take on infinite outcomes, even if it's really not infinite. Quantitative variables can also be analyzed into what we call a frequency table or a relative frequency table. But because we don't have categories or names, we have numbers, the first thing we have to do is create bins of basically intervals, right? So each bin or interval has to be equal in size. So here we have data from a sample of trees. And from every tree, we measured the tree's height. And we have bins of 20 to 30 feet, 30 to 40 feet, and so forth. These bins are what we call left-handed bins, which means you equal a number on the left and you go up to the number on the right. So that first bin is for any tree from 20 up to 29.9999999999 feet. If a tree weighed, or if a tree weighed, if a tree had 30 feet of height, it would go into the next bin. So again, once we set up our bins, and you can set the bins however you want, you can choose whatever interval you want that just has to be consistent. Then you just go through your data and you count. Okay, how many trees were 20 to 30 feet? Count them up, and that's again the frequency. Or you could obviously take that value, divide it by the total of 174 total trees in the sample, and you can get the relative frequency as well. Now, there are four types of graphs that can be made from quantitative data. A dot plot, a stem and leaf plot, a histogram, and a cumulative graph. Now, let's look at our sample of 174 trees, and from every tree we measured its height, which is a quantitative variable, first off because it's a number, technically be continuous because the height of a tree, if you got a really precise measuring tool, could be any value, but again, you get the idea. Now, here is an example of a stem and leaf plot. Cool thing about a stem and leaf plot is you can actually see all the individual values, and they just stack up so you can see the distribution. Then we have a dot plot that puts dots for each individual tree. We could also see where they stack up. We see there's a far less trees on the left, far less trees on the right, most trees kind of in the middle, around 80 feet. Then what we have is called a histogram. I'll probably say that a histogram is the number one preferred graph for quantitative data in all of statistics. Once again, across the x-axis, we see those bins or intervals, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, and then we simply count how many trees fall into each bit. And then we make a bar that goes up to that count or that frequency. You can also make it a relative frequency histogram as well, where that bar goes up to the proportion instead of the count. Now listen, I know it looks like a bar graph, it might smell like a bar graph, it might even taste like a bar graph, but it's not a bar graph. Bar graphs are for categorical data. Don't ever call a histogram a bar graph, you'll offend a statistician somewhere. The really cool thing about it, whether it's a stem and leaf plot, or it's a dot plot, or if it's a histogram, is that you can see the distribution. Remember, the distribution is what values your variable can take on and how often it takes them on. So by looking at these distributions, we can clearly see where there's less data and where there's more data, what heights are most common versus what heights are least common. Now, the fourth type of graph is called a cumulative graph. These are really cool graphs that you actually don't see too often, but they're really, really valuable. Now, here we see a bunch of dots connected by lines. 
Now, every dot has an X and it has a Y. For example, there's a dot at 80 on the X, that's 80 feet, and 0.45 on the Y. Now, what that means is that 45% of all the trees in our sample were below 80 feet. So again, every dot tells you the proportion of data below that particular height. Now, if we look in between, we see that the slopes of the lines connecting the dots are different. A steeper slope simply means that there's more data in that range. So we see that there's a large amount of data from 60 to 70 and also a large amount from 70 to 80. So that's where we see steeper lines. If the line is horizontal, like we see between 0 and 10 or 10 to 20, that means there is no data in those bins whatsoever because there was no change from one to the other. These are great graphs as well to see some really important information about how the data builds up, where there's a lot of data, where there's a little data, all through this idea of looking at the steepness of the lines and understanding that each point tells you the proportion of data below that particular height. Make sure that you know how to analyze these different graphs and be able to answer questions about them. For example, if we look at the histogram, I could say, hey, how many trees are greater than 70 feet? How many trees are less than 70 feet? How many trees between 100 and 120 feet? You got to be able to answer all those questions. It's pretty simple. I going to be able to add them up, make sure you get a rough count as to how many are in each bin, but also make sure if you're looking at a histogram, is it a frequency histogram where it shows how many trees are in each bin? Or is it a relative frequency histogram where it shows what proportion are each in each bin? So it's really important to use all those kind of facts and ideas to answer questions about these different graphs. But for the most part, they're pretty easy questions. In this unit, one of the most important things that you're going to be asked to do is to describe the distribution of a quantitative variable by looking at a graph. Now, when you do this, there's four things that you have to mention. The shape, the center, the spread, and any outliers or other unusual features. Now, when we look at shape, there's lots of different things we could say. Unimodal, bimodal, gap, clusters, symmetric, skewed left, skewed right. When we talk about the center, you're looking for one value that you think best summarizes all the data. Spread is really analysis of how the data varies. And then again, outliers are data values that are very far away from all the other values, whether it be far to the left or far to the right. Let's take a look at several graphs that I've made for you that are gonna enable us to, well, talk about the distributions. Now, every single graph represents a sample of trees selected from all different parts of a forest. Every single sample had roughly 174 trees and we're gonna see how that sample shook out. Now, in these first two graphs, we see the shape of symmetric, but they're both symmetric in different ways. Now, the pink graph is symmetric with most of the data in the middle, so it's going to have a smaller spread. Yes, the overall data does go from 20 to 140, but the majority of data is clustered in the middle near the center of around 80 to 85 feet. Whereas the graph on the bottom also has a center of 80 to 85 feet, but that would be called bimodal because we see a big chunk of data on the left and another big peak of data on the right. Now, even though 80 is probably a good center of the data, it's actually not really a good description of the data because there's actually two centers. It looks like we have two clusters of data. So we've got a bunch of smaller trees centered maybe around 35 feet and a bunch of larger trees centered maybe around 120 feet. This one's gonna be way more spread out. It's gonna vary much, much more because we got so many different trees on the left and so many different trees on the right end of the scale. Whereas the graph in pink has a much smaller spread because the majority of data is all, well, clumped together in the middle. Here we see two more samples of trees. The one in purple is clearly skewed to the left where the majority of the data is on the right. So the center is probably around, I don't know, 120 to 110 feet. And on the one in blue, we see it skewed to the right, which gives us a center of maybe 35 to 40 feet. Now they both have similar spreads, but again, the majority of the data in purple is at the higher end where the majority of the data in the blue is at the lower end. Here we have two more graphs that are both symmetric, but with the biggest difference between these two graphs is how spread out they are. The one in green is far less spread out than the one in purple. In green, we have a center of 80, but it's all clustered together from 60 feet to 100 feet. Whereas in purple, we also have a center probably around 80 feet, but it's very evenly spread from 20 all the way up to 140. When your data is very evenly spread like this, we typically call it uniform. In this last example, we see a very unusual feature of a huge gap. We have a couple trees ranging from 20 to 40 feet at the bottom. Then we have an enormous gap where there's no trees at all. And then we have a Bunch of trees, 80 all the way to 130, with a couple there 100, above 130 feet. 
Now here we can also say that this graph is maybe slightly skewed to the left. And again, describing the center is kind of tough because you might want to jump and say something like 70, but there's not a single tree at 70. A better center here would be looking at maybe 110. Yes, there's a couple trees at the very bottom, but typically trees in this sample are about 110 feet, maybe even say 115. Now, we don't know for sure, but we'll learn a little bit more about this in a couple moments, about outliers, but those trees at the bottom definitely look like they could be outliers. Now, in any of these graphs that we've just taken a look at, we got to make sure that we describe the distribution in context. So if you go back and pause, you can read my descriptions and how I give a quick explanation of the shape, the center, and the spread, and if there's any unusual features in every graph. It really doesn't take a whole lot to describe a distribution, but you got to make sure you mention those four key details.